Good morning, everybody. I wanted to introduce my guest today on Bold Breakthroughs with Heather Morrison. Her name is Victoria Doxit. Is it Doxit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, perfect. Let me read her bio real quick and we'll jump right in. So Victoria is a thought leadership consultant and executive ghostwriter from Hampshire in the UK. She works with consultants, coaches, and senior executives to plan, create, and implement thought leadership content strategies and she ghosts writes business books, white papers, case studies, keynotes, and articles. She is a busy woman. She also has three children, two of which are twins, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they've finally just gone back to school. So oh. They've just come out of lockdown in the UK and um, they are finally back at school. So I have a little bit more free time now and a little bit more time to do my actual work. So it's all good. Exactly. Yeah, the world is starting to thaw out a little bit. We're all kind of going back to whatever normal is going to look like. So good for you. Yeah, it feels like it's getting there. It feels like yeah. we're, we're getting somewhere now. Yeah, yeah. You have a fabulous story. And I wanted to ask you, so kind of take us on the journey of how you came to be. Like, why are you where you are now? What, what was that process? Oh, to be honest, it was it was a bit of an accident. So my background is actually in lecturing. I'm a teacher. I'm a philosophy teacher. And I did that for kind of 15 years um, full time. And it's all I ever wanted to do. Really, And all I thought I would end up doing was was teaching. And then about four years ago, um, I, I was at risk of redundancy. And there was a lot of restructures at my college. And that kind of coincided with my twins being born. And I suddenly thought there's got to be more than marking coursework at nine o'clock in the evening you know so I kind of it was a bit of a, a kick up the bum to see what else I could do really so I started um looking at what else I could do and because with philosophy it's uh, very much a case of translating the ideas of philosophers to an audience of, of teenagers and so they're quite imp quite important skills for kind of communications so I moved into communications. I started working freelance for an agency quite early on, really enjoyed it. Um, and then just kind of got more and more hours and then started getting my own client base. And because I've got the philosophy, it kind of lends itself to thought leadership. So that's how I've ended up ghostwriting business books um, and doing more kind of thought leadership stuff. So I've only been doing it about four years and I still teach part time. So I still teach one day a week. Um, but I have reduced my hours from full time just down to one day over the last three years as my business has grown. So at the moment, it feels like I've got the best of both worlds. Um, but yeah, it was totally an accident. It was never, I've not got any marketing background, no business background. Um, I just fell into communications because I like communicating, I guess. You know, I think I can have a book called The Accidental Entrepreneur because everyone I talk to says the same thing. Like, this isn't how I planned on my life being, right? It just, this isn't what I started off doing and I just kind of fell into it. So that's a very common theme, I think. Yeah, I think with women, especially as well, when you have your children, you kind of see this fork in the path and, and it, it was a big wake up call for me. And I know for a lot of, of a lot of women my age as well, you kind of think, well, you know, you, you don't want to be trapped in the nine to five. You want to be doing something that is better for family life. Um, so I think a lot of female entrepreneurs you know, kind of 30s or, you know, late 30s um, start building up their own business or doing something on the side. So I don't think it's uncommon. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I love being an entrepreneur is that it allows you to to kind of fit it around your life you know you it's your business you get to run it how you want to run it which is the genius of being an entrepreneur right yeah absolutely it's really empowering um, and also it's, it shines a light on the other stuff that i do as well so with teaching you know you do so much that's not even acknowledged let alone valued or paid for you know there's a lot of stuff that i do in my teaching work that's that's just part and parcel of the job with my client work, I invoice for everything. And you, you see a, a big disparity between what you would do for free in the public sector and what you would actually get paid for in the private sector. Um, so I think it's actually helped me be a bit more of an efficient teacher by drawing kind of clearer boundaries about what I'm you know, willing to do and what I'm not willing to, <laughs> to do. Um, so I think it's actually been quite, help, quite healthy as well to learn that. Yeah, that's one of my favorite, oh, that's one of my favorite boundaries. <clears throat> so I wanted to find out, um, you know, being an entrepreneur isn't all sunshine and roses. So I wanted to find out what kind of what kind of challenges were you met with along the way while you were building this this business? Oh gosh. So look, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> that was probably the biggest one. Um, I've come from public service background. I've not got any 
I don't really have any peers in business. I don't I don't know anyone who owns their own business or runs their own business. Um, most of my friends through work are professionals, they're lecturers or they're teachers or they're social workers or, you know, that kind of background. Um, so even doing things like invoicing, I'd never done that before. Um, you know, trying to onboard a client, I just didn't, I, I just found it all out through trial and error, really. And which has actually good, stood me in good stead. So I've learned a lot through, you know, people, my clients were being very kind to me, I think, um, when I first started out. But then I was charging very low prices when I first started. So I guess it was, you know, it was fair enough, I suppose. Um, but yeah, kind of not knowing what I was doing and also the constraints of time. So just trying to do everything at the, during the time that the kids are at school, plus trying to juggle um, a full time job you know it wasn't easy the first year was was really difficult and I wasn't earning any money because most of the stuff that I was doing was either very low paid or I was doing it for free so I was trying to build my portfolio by writing articles um or you know content website content or whatever for for you know free or very low money just to get the portfolio and the testimonials so I, I kind of I did quite well to stick at it really I think for the first year I, I could see that there was definitely potential and um, which is why I didn't give up and I'm glad I didn't because now it's it's really taken off and it's good. But yeah, the first year was was really difficult. It wasn't easy. And I think that's a really <laughs> I think that's a really great um, uh, reminder for people that that we don't have to have it all figured out, right? I mean, most of my, my most of my business is run on Google. If I don't know how to do something like invoice somebody, I'll Google how do I invoice somebody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really great reminder to entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs that are starting out, that if you don't know, if you don't know what you're doing, right, that's not necessarily a sign you need to give up. You just need to figure out where to find out, you know, how, how you can do whatever you're not able to do at the moment, right? So absolutely, absolutely. And I think for me, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. So I am um, not a massive fan of social media, to be honest, but I went into LinkedIn when I first started my business and I just found so many helpful people there and so much helpful resources. Um, and I built a hugely strong network, which is now supporting me. Um, and I support my network, you know, with ref referrals or recommendations or whatever. Um, so putting the time in to ask questions and not expect anything back and doing it in a, hum doing it in a humble way you know, it, it really paid off because I now I've, I found out all the answers by people willing to spend time teaching me. And yeah, Google for everything else. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you raise another really good point that it's not, you know, the genius is to reach out to other people that, that are a little further along in their in their adventure than you are, right? And ask for help. And most of the time, I have not ever found a person that said, you know, I'm, I really don't have time to help you. Most people appreciate where you've been and they are more than willing to extend a helping hand and let you know, you know, how they did it or what worked for them and what didn't work for them. So that's a really important yeah. Message, Victoria. It's, yeah, it's true. And I think if you can do it in a, in a humble way um, and be really grateful, then you you just reap the rewards of that. Maybe not immediately, but certainly further down the line. Um, and also it's just good to have friends. You know, it's just nice to have friends in business because as I said before, none of my friends are in business. So LinkedIn has given me friends who are in business. Um, and sometimes just being able to moan at someone, you know, or, you know, moan about something that's happened with a client is, is just really helpful. It's really helpful. Um, and I would never have got that without, you know, LinkedIn, really. Yeah, yeah. Super important to have a community. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Especially when you're freelance or you're an entrepreneur, you know, and you're doing it on your own. Yeah, exactly. I remember when I was working and my son would say, um, when are you going to go to back to work and work a real job, right? <laughs> So it's nice to have somebody else that really appreciates that as an only an entrepreneur would, right? So what's your what's your passion project right now? What are you kind of knee deep in working on? Um, so it's actually really interesting um, kind of collection of people came together during the first lockdown. So kind of March, April last year um, when everyone was grounded. So I work in thought leadership. So most of my clients do the speaking circuits or they do TED Talks, or they're doing TV, or, you know, they're, they're on stages a lot of the time. And obviously that was completely shut down. Um, so for a while, I'd been going to a webinar uh, about thought leadership that was hosted by Peter, uh, um, Bill Winnick and Peter Sherman, who do thought leadership leverage in, in America. Um, and through this webinar, we kind of, I kind of connected with quite a few other people interested in thought leadership or people who were thought leadership. Um, kind of you know consultants or they were thought leaders themselves 
Um, and we kind of set up a, a, a side project um, and we're now working together on a book about the future of working. We've done a conference on uh, thought leadership for, you know, post pandemic thought leadership. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good thing to be involved with. Um, and I think that's gonna, gonna take off actually. I think we're, we kind of spent about nine months working on it. And I think now once the book is done, I think that will kind of um, catalyze things a bit more. So that's a really interesting thing to be working on. So tell us a little bit about what thought leadership is, if people aren't familiar with what that is. Yeah, so I think it's it's probably bigger in America than it is in the UK at the moment. And it, sometimes it's called authority marketing. Um, not everyone likes the term thought leadership because it does sound a little bit pretentious. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's basically the idea that you are establishing authority through producing content that is informative and knowledgeable and educational. And you are trying to answer the questions of your customers by producing the answers in an easily digestible format and if you can do that consistently without pushing it and without being salesy then you will start to see your reputation become enhanced you will have increased visibility and you will start to you know receive more income more invitations to speak more invitations to contribute to sector publications all that kind of stuff so it's a long-term strategy um, and you need to produce a lot of content. So business books is probably the, the biggest piece of content that you can produce for thought leadership, but articles, podcasts, um, case studies, all, all of that will go into helping you to, to show that you're, you're, you know, you're an authority in the area that you are dealing in. Um, and I like it because it links to philosophy, because instead of translating the ideas of philosophers, I'm translating the ideas of business leaders. So there's no difference in the skills, um, it's just it's a different audience and a different purpose, but it's exactly the same skills. And I think that's why I enjoy it, really. It's interesting. It's really interesting. And I get to hear the business ideas first, which is which is exciting. Fantastic. Wow. Well, so what's your what's your five year vision with all of this and with your company and the book that you've got coming out, what you've got going on? What's what's that going to look like over the next five years? Um, it's I mean, part of being an entrepreneur for me is about the work-life balance. It's not about, I'm not really an empire grower. Um, I think the business has got potential to grow. And I think kind of in five years, I think I would like to be moving towards an agency model. Um, mm -hmm. I've already started outsourcing some of the drafting work. Um, and I think if things continue as they are, then I could probably start outsourcing a little bit more and doing more consultancy myself. I'm kind of going more into the consultancy at the moment. But to be honest, it's more about having a decent standard of income and the time with the kids you know I'd rather finish at two and have a bit less money and a bit less stress to be honest at least for now because my kids are five so my oldest is seven and my youngest are five um and I think until they're teenagers and they can film for themselves I'm happy just building it slowly and not over facing myself um you know I, I don't want to rush things there's no there's no reason to rush things yeah, yeah, and that's why with whoa. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you getting feedback on your end too? A little bit, but it's not it's a little bit. too bad. Okay, good. All right, good, good, good. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I have a 12 year old now, and he's as you know, it's very age appropriate that now he's very independent. But mm -hmm. when he was younger, I didn't focus on building my business because I wanted to spend that time with him because that time I'm not going to get back. There's always going to be work to do. There's always going to be ways for me to build my business, right? But that time of him, you know, hugging and cuddling and that kind of thing and wanting me around all the time yeah. is, is only going to come around once in a, life, in a lifetime. So I really, I really appreciate that too, especially when you've got You've got a lot on your play, right? With three of, of them and two of them being twins. I mean, so you've yeah. got you've got like three times the amount of moments to catch and to to hold Absolutely. on to and savor. That is awesome. Yeah. And what a what a great um uh what a just what a great attitude to have about that. I think know? I think it's the healthy attitude to have. You know, I think in, you know, you've got to look after your own mindfulness and your own mental health and I think from working with students I still work I still teach part-time with my students at age 16 to 19 and this lockdown in particular there is so much anxiety within the young people that I come into contact with um and I just it's so when it hits you and you have that lack of confidence or you feel that you're overfaced or you're stressed or whatever it's just it can can mess up everything in your life 
So I think I'm quite conscious, especially after lockdown and the pandemic, to just enjoy what I'm doing. <laughs> You know, just enjoy having clients and just enjoy doing the work I'm doing and enjoy being around the kids um, yeah, and everything exactly. else can come later. You know, there's no there's absolutely no rush. Yeah, I think that's one of the silver linings of all of this is that we're kind of we're cocooning back with our family. Right. And really dialing yeah. into to what's important and getting that little bit of a balance back. So I really appreciate that. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever received along the way? That was probably for my mum. So my mum, when my my youngest son was born, so my first child was born, she said, don't listen to anyone else's advice. <laughs> that was her advice, which is kind of, <laughs> kind of <laughs> paradoxical. But I always, yeah, I think, you know what, just do it your own way. No one knows how you are as a mum or, you know, and I just apply that to my business as well. So it's all very good listening to other people, but ultimately listen to your own advice and do what you think because no one knows yourself or your business or your family like you do. So yeah, that was yeah. That's, that's a good piece of advice. Don't listen to anyone else's advice. <laughs> <laughs> Except your mother. You're always supposed to listen to your mother. I love that idea because I think that, you know, we as entrepreneurs, we don't know what we're doing a lot of times when we set out, right? Mm -hmm. And as mothers, like when you're a first time mother, yay, right? And you think that you're doing everything wrong. And so to yeah. take a little bit about what this book says and a little advice from that friend and, and then wrap it with what's in your head and your heart and do ultimately Absolutely. what feels good to you, right? I love that. Absolutely. Go, go mom. <laughs> <laughs> so what's a, what's a habit? like something that you do consistently that's been instrumental to your success or instrumental to your growth or to your happiness? Um, I think the time management. So as a teacher, I've always been really good. Every teacher is really good at their time management. And you know that you've only got an hour to plan the lesson because you'll be teaching in an hour and it has to be done. You know, you can't procrastinate. And that's something that is just part of me now after doing it for kind of 15, 20 years. Um, so I know that I've only got between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m to do whatever work it is I need to get done. And if I don't get it done, I have to work weekends and I have to work evenings because I can't work past three o'clock. You know, I can't work again until seven o'clock when the kids are in bed. So I'm very good at not procrastinating now. And I think that's just something that my career as a teacher has taught me. So I just get on and, and get on and do it. And I think having those time, having that efficiency of time, I think is probably the best thing. Um, the best thing that I do, yeah, the best habit. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny when I was in school, in college, I worked five days a week and went to school two days a week. So I had a day off every 90 days. So I worked 90 days straight. I got to tell you how much stuff I got done because I knew I can't put this off till Sunday because I don't have a Sunday, right? So yeah. I, love that, I love that you bring that up. Like you have to get really good. Like the, the, the best way to get something done is give it to a busy mom, right? Because she Absolutely. knows how to manage her time. She knows that she's, I got to do this now. I can't afford to put this off. So I think that's huge. Time yeah. management is huge. So looking back i like to ask the question both ways and you choose whatever answer you want to answer to what is something that you're you would have done differently or what is something you're really glad that you did um i don't think i would have done anything differently i mean i, I think learning on the game is a probably a good way to learn because you know you really have to learn when you're you're learning it for yourself i think the thing that i'm most pleased i did was was spending the time on linkedin um you know, when I first started out, I had a lot, I spent a lot of time just, just reading. I didn't really post anything because I was a bit nervous. I didn't really know what this business world was like. Um, but I think the time that I spent connecting with people on LinkedIn and having proper conversations and engaging with their content and learning about marketing from, from real people has, has been the best thing for me. Um, because I've, like, like I said before, I've made a lot of really genuine friends and I've learned a lot in the process. And now I'm much more confident in the way that I use the platform and probably 90% of my leads, well, probably about 70% of my leads come from LinkedIn now and the rest are referrals. So it's really, you know, putting that time on early, putting that time in early on has really paid dividends for me. Um, so yeah, anyone who's thinking about setting up a business, I certainly suggest they, they, you know, acquaint themselves with LinkedIn and start using it, but, but not in a pushy way, you know, just read what other people are doing and connect with people and build your network. Because in the long term, that's, that's going to be helpful. And so that's probably the best thing that I've done, I think. That is, that's hugely um, 
helpful advice because I think a lot of people jump on social media and if they don't get the response back, first of all, they only jump on social media when they've got something going on in their business. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do. Right. And then that's your first point of contact with somebody is that they're reaching out to sell you something. Right. As opposed to like you did putting in that authentic relationship building time Mm -hmm. and actually be genuinely interested in what do you have going on in your business with no expectation of anything in return, but just building that relationship. I think that's a lost art that we've forgotten to do in business. Right. But also, I mean, so, also, I didn't realize this at the time, but one of the people that I was having one of these initial conversations with, and this goes back four years, I've just completed or I was about to complete a 10K project with this person who wanted to work with me because we were friends and she kind of trusted me. So I didn't ever envision that happening. Um, and I'm she probably didn't either. But it just so happens that it does work out. You know, if you if you give without wanting to receive, you end up getting stuff back, I think, even if you don't particularly want it it happens so it's a good yeah good thing. because when people have those opportunities to give they're going to give it to people that they know like and trust yeah absolutely 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 and that's what thought leadership is really it's creating opportunities where you can help people to trust you so that's that's kind of how I but then I think that's the thing with teaching with teaching I don't go into a classroom and try and sell the kids stuff I get them engaged by teaching them things that are interesting and asking them questions and I don't go in there and show my certificates and my degree and you know show them all my qualifications I go in there and I talk to them and by the end of the first lesson hopefully they realize that I know what I'm talking about and that's how I worked on LinkedIn and that's how I work in thought leadership with my clients you know it's different I think to how a lot of people do it but it works for me. No, I love that idea of incorporating more of that teacher mentality of that. I get to use a lot more of that too. That's that's a really great reminder because your kids don't care what, what qualifications you have, right? They just yeah. want to know that you care about them. You have that genuine connection with them and they're learning from you. That's a yeah. really great reminder, Victoria. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So what are some of the, you talked a lot about, and obviously you are obviously into ongoing education. So what are some of the things that you are feeding your brain right now, like podcasts or books or webinars or... Uh- yeah, so I, t- I will talk more about Thought Leadership Leverage uh, podcast, which is really good. Um, so that they have lots of interesting guests all in- involved in thought leadership. Um, and Dory Clark was on there about a month ago, and I've just bought her book um, called Stand Out. We've just started reading it, so I'm a little bit late because I meant to- I bought it about a month ago and I've only just started reading it. Um, but that's about thought leadership and about the importance of building a personal brand um, and growing your influence in a kind of non pushy way. So it kind of rings true with what I think personally so that's that's really good Dory Clark is a really good um thought leader um and other than that I, I most of the stuff I read is what I read for work really so I end up reading um philosophy and, and classics so I teach philosophy and classics so I end up reading a lot of um kind of Homer and stuff which is actually quite good because it's a bit different from reading white papers and articles for my clients so that kind of keeps me a bit fresh reading <laughs> reading philosophy you are very well balanced, I will have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be. I'm not sure if I uh, succeed in that. <laughs> Fantastic. And so I want to wrap up today by asking you if there's anything that you wanted to add to our conversation or anything you'd like to share with our audience. Um, yeah, so I mean, I started off content writing and I've moved into thought leadership. So if anyone watching this or listening to this would like to reach out to me on LinkedIn and talk about thought leadership or transitioning from content writing into thought leadership niche, um, they're very welcome to get in touch with me. I do do some mentoring for writers who want to change into this niche. So um, please feel free to reach out to me if you want to. Perfect. And so I will put your information because I'm assuming people can find you under your name at LinkedIn is the best place to find you. Yep. But my website is www.victoriadoxat.com um, and you can email me at victoria at victoriadoxat.com as well. Perfect. And I highly recommend that people follow your blog. It's called Jelly Stories. What's the name of it again? Yeah, je- Jelly Nightmares. Jelly Nightmares. Because yeah. you're, you're a riot. You are funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just love hearing your yeah, adventures. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a bit different to what I write for my clients. My client stuff tends to be quite serious, but Jelly Nightmares is um, is a kind of a dark, humorous look at a, some. Sur- I had some surgery. I I was quite seriously ill a couple of years ago, and I had lots of surgery. Um, and a lot of the surgery I had was kind of breast reconstructions and stuff. So I've written this blog about my experiences. 
Um, and a, it's, a lot of people seem to like it because it's a bit of a lighter read than the normal kind of doom and gloom that you get about uh, surgery. So yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I did a lot. And I really appreciate the fact that you're very honest with, uh, you know, like what it's like to be a mom. And, you know, you don't always like your kids. You love them, but you don't always like them. And, and just the, <laughs> yeah, just your sense of humor was just hysterical. So I'm so glad that I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you'd like to add? No, I don't think so. I just really thank you for having us on. And I hope that, you know, if, I know for mums, especially, it can seem that it's really difficult to find time to do anything. But you can set up a business on a couple of hours a week. You know, you, you, you can do it if you've got the right mindset. So it's worth exploring other options, I think, if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for leaving with that, leaving us with that thought, because I think women tend to put themselves and their lives on hold until the children leave. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's necessary. I don't think you have to do that. And you also don't need 60 hours to a week to build a, to build a business either. So that's a really, really great reminder, Victoria. I appreciate you being here with us so much today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. Go off and enjoy those kids of yours and go off and enjoy some free time now that those kids are scurried back to school. <laughs> absolutely. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.